Good morning. For those who don't uh, know me, I am Darren Morgan with Shenard's Nursery here in Corvallis, Oregon. And uh, today I wanted to talk with you and share some of my experiences with dry irrigation, dry, dry irrigation or dry vegetable gardening, um, gardening vegetable crops with no irrigation. Um, and, and high to the north of Scotland. Um, one of the things we'll talk about here, but I do want to make it really, really clear up front. Dry vegetable gardening or dryland gardening or dryland farming varies tremendously from region to region. So my experiences here in Corvallis may not relate well to the Gulf Coast or the Midwest or Northern Europe. Uh, there, there's, definitely, there's definitely some takeaways you can get from this, but with the differences in climate and soil conditions, um, your mileage may vary. So just be well, well aware of that as you're coming into this. Um, so dry, dry vegetable gardening is kind of a, a, an old thing becoming new. Uh, of course, uh, settlers out here in the, in the West uh, did not have the option to irrigate crops. A lot of crops were grown commercially, but a lot of them were grown also for home consumption. And the ability to, uh, to grow a lot of crops was dependent on appropriate planting times and uh, the ability to carry buckets of water from the creek. So it is an old set of techniques and it has enjoyed a fair resurgent in modern, re resurgence in modern times in the form of dry farming, uh, where the cost of the input of irrigation is a significant part of the cost of, of cropping certain plants and the ability to grow crops without irrigating on a commercial scale uh, is a relevant concern. So it's beginning to come back around now to the home gardener with a increased interest in conserving, uh, conserving moisture and water and water resources and also simply the expense of paying for water. Um, and so bringing this back to the home garden on a small scale requires addressing it a little different. You're not gonna, you're not gonna grow rows and rows of row crops like the, the dry farmers are doing. Um, so you have to address it somewhat differently. So that's what we wanna talk about today. Uh, I'm kind of new to dry gardening myself. Uh, I've experimented with it a little bit. I've been read the references. I've been in contact with the master gardeners doing a lot of this. Um, last summer was my first full scale dry gardening experiment with a full third of my vegetable garden going into unirrigated gardening. Um, and as we'll talk about in there, there are crops you can grow this way. There are crops you, that are not suitable for dryland gardening. Dryland gardening is not suitable for all sites. Um, and as I mentioned at the outset, your mileage may vary in different climates. Um, this is really focused on Pacific Northwest gardening with our uh, dry summer climate. Um, it is very different on the East Coast, very different in the desert Southwest. And you may need to do some additional consulting with local experts to get the tweaks and, and, uh, and tips for your specific area. So what is dry gardening? Well, the whole point of dry gardening is to dry a, to grow a vegetable crop, an edible crop, without adding supplemental irrigation. In other words, completely dependent on natural rainfall uh, to provide all irrigation for the entire growing season. While it's complementary, dry gardening does not usually include uh, the the cropping of plants that are already done before the dry season. So like your overwintered broccoli and cauliflower are dry garden, but it's not normally part of the dry gardening conversation because they're grown over the winter when we have rain and they're finished uh, harvesting out before we get dry enough in the summer for, the, for that to be an issue again for them. So we're not talking about really short term crops like early spring radishes and peas that are naturally often grown without irrigation simply because they don't need it. Um, nor the overwintered crops that normally are done by them. So as I mentioned, it's not suitable for all crops in all situations. There are some definite limits uh, to successful dry gardening. And here are some of the big limits that, that you're going up against. First of all, not all crops are really suited uh, for, for dry gardening. And uh, this is not intended to be a comprehensive list. Um, but it's a pretty solid list of, of high, relatively high success rate crops for, again, for the Pacific Northwest. Tomatoes were far and away my most successful crop. Um, squashes, I did a lot of summer squashes. You can do winter squashes as well. I have not done them because I have other resources for, uh, for winter squashes besides the ones I grow myself. Melons, surprisingly enough, uh, do quite well on unirrigated. Um, peppers, like their tomato cousins, do well. One of my surprise successes was kale. I had read about people doing that in, in coastal climates in Northern California and thought it was worth a try for the, from the similarities and it worked quite well last summer. Uh, 
Um, some root crops will take it without deterioration, other root crops won't. Carrots are a high success rate. Beets are talked about a lot in the literature, though I haven't done that one myself. Uh, they're gonna be very similar to carrots for success rate. Potatoes and bush beans are somewhat limited, but can be done successfully, at least on good years. Your site limits are gonna be very relevant, especially with our, with our broad reach with the Zoom classes. So climate, this is, um, Everything I'm talking about today is really focused on the Pacific Northwest with our, our relatively wet winters, long wet springs. And then once we dry out in mid to late May or so, it's not uncommon for us to have no significant rainfall events until September, October, maybe a very a scarce summer shower. Um, unlike the, for example, the East Coast or parts of the Midwest where summer rains are the norm. So it is different here. Um, and so really dry, soils uh, and, and climates in the desert southwest will be more challenged with a much more limited range of crop options uh, for, that you can actually grow there. The native soils are, are, are relevant. You can't really dry garden in containers or raised beds. Um, they simply dry out too fast. Uh, you, they don't have the ability to draw upon the, uh, the native soil profile to, to access water that's inherently stored already in the soil. Um, not all native soils are good uh, dry gardening soils. Super sandy soils are a problem, very, very poor quality rocky or sandy soils. Um, clay soils actually do really well. One of, the, one of the few benefits to gardening on clay is they hold water quite well. Um, of course, when they do dry out, they often crack to the point where you might have some issues with root damage. But all in all, um, clay is not an inherently bad thing when we're talking about dry gardening. And, but humusy soils and, or humus clay blends are some of the best soils for, for dry gardening in. Because of the need to space the crops wider to reduce the competition for, for water and, and nutrient resources, um, it's really important that you're working in a sizable area. Doing a, doing a very small patch, a three, you know, a three by eight patch, is not going to get you much crop on dry gardening. You need to dedicate a fair amount of space. Crops do have to be spread wider to make this work. Those areas that you're gardening in the dry garden cannot be too marginal. Uh, when we talk about marginal garden areas, we're talking about situations where the shade from the, from the nearby trees is starting to get iffy, uh, pretty substantial amounts of shade, not much direct sun. Um, or areas that have quite a bit of turf um, encroaching into them or along the side of them can, can limit the ability to dry, dry garden because of competition. Tree roots are a long way past uh, the edge even of the canopy. And the tree roots are, are often notoriously competitive for available resources, including water resources. So this does have to be an area that where you don't have a lot of tree roots and you don't have a lot of encroaching weeds or encroaching turf. You have to keep it fairly clear, um, not only in the gardening area, but around the perimeter so you're not having too much stealing of resources. The last thing I wanted to point out with dry gardening is you are dependent upon mother nature when you're dry gardening. And as I was mentioning a little bit ago, last year was a particularly great year for dry gardening with our weather patterns. That is not always the case. We sometimes dry out as early as mid-April uh, and have exceptionally hot dry summers that continue in several several weeks maybe of 90 plus degree weather. Um, those things will impact your success with dry gardening so that you'll have some years when you're more successful and some years when you're less successful when you're dependent upon mother nature. So we're going to go through um, the, the basic crops I mentioned at the outset and uh, overall results with them a few quick hints, and then we'll talk a little bit more about how to make this work. Um, at that point, I am happy to uh, take uh, verbal questions. In the interim, while we're going through slides, if you have questions relevant to a specific crop as I'm going through, if you wanna put it in chat, I'll try to tackle them as we go through as best I can, but there will be time to share questions at the end as well. Tomatoes were the overall high success crop uh, in the dry garden last uh, this last year. Um, they're a simple crop to grow in the dry, dry gardening. Their natural planting cycle matches up with the ability to work those wet soils. Um, and the yield with the tomato crop was basically as good or very minimally different. Um, we had as, as high a yield as good quality fruit. Um, and with the lack of irrigation, they actually initiated fruit ripening maybe just a little bit earlier than their, than their compatriots out in the irrigated section. <clears throat> 
One issue we did run into with the tomatoes in the dry garden, um, blossom end rot, which is caused by calcium deficiency. In our low calcium soils, I do lime for my calcium dependent crops like, like tomatoes and like melons, um, squashes. And we saw an increase in the amount of blossom end rot seasonally, and it would seem to be relevant to the hotter, drier periods of the summer. Um, even though we re-limed like we always do about 4th of July for the vegetable garden, um, we still had an increased incidence of blossom and rot from calcium deficiency. So the drier soils had inhibited apparently the ability of the plant to take up the lime and, and reduce that, that issue. Other than that, uh, high success rate crops, they were, they were tremendous and you could look at across the garden and you could look at the, uh, the tomatoes in the irrigated section and the tomatoes in the dry section and then we used some of the same varieties in both locations just to make it comparable. And it was very hard to tell a, a performance dif difference apart, highly successful. Squashes, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, I didn't do any winter squashes on this planting. Uh, my, my father is still an active gardener, just a little bit north of me, and he grows tons and tons of winter squashes. So growing something I'm not going to eat because we already have way too many being shared did not seem a, a valuable use of the, of the time and resources. But uh, the summer squashes, the zucchini, uh, were, were incredibly successful. They grew as big as the ones in the irrigated garden with lots of flowers, lots of productivity. The yield was somewhat lower. That's not inherently a bad thing when you put two or three uh, zucchini plants in. Um, we often as you hit the peak of the growing season and you're picking them every day, you get worn out trying to keep them picked and trying to keep them consumed before they go bad. So a slight reduction in yield was not a problem and it was not very significant. The yield was, was still quite good. There was definitely an increase, especially in the very end of the production season with the blossom end rot again from calcium deficiency. Um, was not noticeable during the early, uh, early surges at all, but by the very end of the season and uh, the fires and smoke and ash and all of that, um, I'm sure didn't help out, but um, we lost a lot of the late fruit on these due to it rotting out from the flower end back, which to me indicates definitively uh, calcium deficiency. Um, big plant, lots of space. That is always an issue when we're talking about dry gardening. It's always an issue in the vegetable garden with zucchini anyway, and you're gonna have the same kind of issues to deal with with winter squashes and the amount of space they occupy. But when you're giving the space for the root zone for water anyway, this seems a, a good use of dry garden space. Um, bell peppers, didn't do any hot peppers this season. Uh, nobody in my family will eat enough of them besides me to get excited about, um, but should be comparably uh, comparable in results. Um, one of the biggest things I noticed about my bell peppers is um, the, inc the speed up of the ripening process in the unirrigated garden. Um, they definitely began to ripen out and color um, a week to maybe two weeks ahead of the, the similar plants in the, in the irrigated garden. The trade-off for that was the yield was definitely a bit lower. The fruit was definitely a bit smaller than in the irrigated parcels. Uh, but the yield was still good and having those peppers ready a little bit earlier was definitely worth benefit. I don't think I would plant my entire pepper crop in the dry garden, but um, I will definitely put more peppers in the dry garden again next year. It was very successful. Um, less so than with the tomatoes and squashes, but there was some increase in, again, flower and rot from the calcium deficiency. And because the foliage was also a bit smaller, not quite so lush and all covering, we did have some shoulder sun scald on the, on the, on the humps of those peppers. Not enough to be a real significant issue, but something you might want to keep an eye on, uh, potentially put a small amount of shade screen or a, or a physical block of the sun, of the sun angle uh, to reduce that a little bit. So um, this was one of my surprise successes. I'd read about it, but I didn't see anybody really doing that much up in our, in our area with kale. Um, but I'd read about it being, being done fairly extensively in Northern California and on an agricultural scale. And so we gave it a try. I only did lacinato. It's the, the kale I consume the most of, the, 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 the bigger, coarser leafed kales. Um, I'll try some frilly stuff this next year because it was a very, very successful. I did notice that the leaves were smaller, were slightly tougher. That's really not a problem when you're oiling them and throwing them on the grill uh, for, for crispy kale on the barbecue. Um, but um, the, the, they were slightly tougher and definitely smaller, so the yield was reduced. Um, it was definitely uh, enough of success to repeat. 
uh, and I will experiment more with that. This question in the chat about mulching. Um, it doesn't look like I mulched, but I did. We're going to talk about that a few slides down as we go through. Mulching is an integral part of dry gardening, and we'll talk about that in techniques. They were mulched at planting, and we've done some crumb mulching. So when we we're going through in the early stages of weeding the garden, and we're actually cultivating out the weeds and chopping up the soil, not immediately over the root zone, but just outside of the root zones and growing areas of the plants. Um, then we're raking that crumb soil that we've, we've cultivated up back over the root system. So we're using a, na a natural soil mulch in addition to the organic mulch we put down at the outset. So it doesn't look like there's a lot of mulch there, but there's, there's more mulch than it looks like because it's been covered over with a, with a crumb soil mulch. Carrots. Um, one of the things I wanted to point out about my carrot success in the dry garden is we did have a long period of some continuing uh, rainfall through the spring and into the early summer. Um, this is a, an important factor for me. So I'm on wetland clay soils, uh, northeast end of Corvallis, for those who are familiar with the area. And so I really cannot start my carrots now, even though the soil temperatures are high enough, because I cannot work the soil without damaging the soil structure. Um, tilth is very important on dry gardening and it's important to soil conservation in general. And um, I can't work that soil a lot of times until the middle part of May. I'm physically too wet uh, in the soil texture to, to do it. So uh, I had to get them started in the mid-May planting cycle along with the rest of the garden. Last year, we had uh, enough moisture for good germination. Carrots take a very long time to germinate. Uh, 21, 22 days is not uncommon just for seed germination. Um, so that went really well last year, but I can see that if it had been a, a noticeably drier spring and, and early summer, that I might've had a poorer germination on that. Uh, it is a, a common problem with later plantings of carrots that not enough, act enough moisture in if they're not irrigated well enough or frequently enough um, to get poor germination. And that could be an issue. So it's something you wanna keep, uh, keep in mind when you're planting this. The yield was quite good. The yield per square foot I thought was quite comparable to my irrigated carrots. The individual carrots were a lot more variable in size. I had some very nice carrots out of that and a significant, a higher percentage than normal of smaller, slightly deformed carrots. I think maybe I thinned like I normally would in the irrigation, irrigated section. Um, I think maybe I should have thinned it up a little bit harder and, and cost myself a little bit of actual yield to have a little bit more uniform size, larger size carrots. Uh, I think the competition might have been there. Um, there's room for some more experimentation there. The overall yield was good, was very successful. The carrots, though, on the, uh, though averaging a little smaller and being more variable in size, stored just as well and tasted just as good. So definitely successful and definitely something I would do again. Potatoes. Okay, so it's another instance of your mileage may vary. So as I mentioned, I'm on wetland clay soils. Um, so it does limit my early planting. It's also kind of a challenge to get really good potato production on those heavy soils in the first place. So those soils do limit my productivity in general. Um, combining that with increased spacing on the potatoes um, and the absolutely zero irrigation post planting um, did reduce the yield and the tuber size noticeably but not to a point where it's not worth doing. Uh, if you can uh, spare the space and spare the expense of the added seed potatoes for planting uh, to, to get enough yield, uh, it definitely was a success. I had good potatoes out of them. They stored well, they tasted great. They stored better than some of my ears. potatoes coming out out of the irrigated garden because the skins were a bit tougher as, as you would imagine. And that's ideal. Um, one of the challenges for me with potatoes and some of the other crops like garlic is I do a very interplanted garden. I don't have dedicated rows of potatoes. My potatoes are intermixed with other vegetable crops. Same thing with, with, uh, with my garlic. And ideally for best storage on these crops, you should cut the water to them two weeks before harvesting, two or three weeks before harvesting, so that they toughen up and skin up a little bit more. That's really hard for me to do in the irrigated parts of the garden. That was natural in, in the dry parts of the garden, and they, and they stored quite well with, with very, very little storage problems. So overall success, there was definitely a decrease in yield, but uh, not, uh, not unsustainable decrease in yield. Okay, this was a surprise for me, but I had to try it um, because I thought we could probably get away with at least a minimal crop. 
bush beans they're they're on that borderline of a crop that is may finish up or may get a good harvest out before we're dry anyway if you get an early planting of beans out in uh, in mid-april and bush beans have about a 50 to 60 day to maturation period um, it's real common we're still getting some rainfall into early june um, so it, it's quite possible to get uh to get an early harvest out of them um, and not really counted as perhaps dry gardening because it's the entire growing season's in the wet season. But I did leave them in post the first harvest and um, I did get a good reflush right about the time of those fires. So that was September. So despite being totally unirrigated for the rest of the summer, um, the beans were a success. Uh, the bush beans were a success. I don't think you could get away with pole beans doing it that way. But bush beans are something I will try again and experiment more with some of the other varieties of bush beans and see how that works. Um, this is also noted, although I, I didn't do it myself in the, in the garden, as a, as a viable way to grow uh, shelling beans, bush shelling beans. Um, again, a problem we have with our uh, relatively cool growing seasons and, uh, and frequent moisture events is sometimes hard to get dry shelling beans to mature and dry. Um, this is noted as a way to encourage a quick ripening and, uh, and a drier situation for harvest. So something, if you like to do shelling beans, you might consider doing them in a dry garden. Okay, so kind of overview on the crops there. Let's talk a little bit about how this works. To make the dry garden work, you're gonna have to have a site that's suitable, growing crops that are suitable, and start as early as is practical. Um, normally here in, in Western Oregon, we have a wide window of potential planting dates for a lot of these main season crops. Um, but you're going to have to get the jump start on them to maximize your success so they can do a lot of their developmental stages while we're still having some natural rainfall. As early as practical means it doesn't do you any good to put out your tomatoes now. We were 28 degrees a few nights ago, um, so you're, you'll lose them if you put them out now. Uh, as I mentioned earlier in, in my situation with my wet clay soils, I can't work the soil without damaging the soil structure uh, any earlier than I do. So that means that my normal planting window for most crops is from, uh, for most summer crops is from about early to mid-May, might run as late as early to mid-June. Uh, sometimes we've had years and I'm not dry enough to get a much of a garden in until early June. Late plantings like early June plantings are going to struggle in a dry garden situation. So you have to make the effort whenever possible to get them out in as early as you can. Definitely prep the area ahead of time. You want to, if you've got a cover crop or weeds growing on the spot, you want to make sure that's tilled in at least three weeks ahead of planting. And then you'll follow up before planting by cultivating the area, by, by, by taking all the weeds out through another surface, uh, at least a surface level cutting. Um, you can do that with a hoe, you can do that with a, with a cultivator tiller, but definitely do a second cycle through in, in terms of site prep, area prep, uh, to make sure you get as much of that re-sprouted weed as you can out before the planting season. In the course of planting, it's gonna be important that you do large holes, and what we normally don't talk about here is deep holes. Um, normally, if you've got enough, you're six or eight inches, enough space to get your crops in the ground, you're fine. With dryland gardening, you want to make sure you're reaching down to create wicking areas so that any moisture that's trapped in the various la layers of your soil have access to still keep wicking up and the roots to penetrate down in. So deeper holes than usual, if you're breaking your, your, uh, your soil at 12 to 15 inches out of also more space than you would normally allow for the root zones of these crops to make sure they've got a thoroughly amended uh, space in that. Do more organic material incorporated into that soil um, at planting unless you're already super humusy. Uh, additional compost worked into those native soils will help with nutrient retention and moisture retention as well as helping that wicking process. In the planting stages, make sure you're spacing your plants adequately. Um, Minimum spacing is twice the normal recommended spacing. So typically with tomato plants, I'll put them three to four feet apart. It's barely enough room to work between them. They should be six or seven feet apart in the dry garden. They need that access to that moisture through that larger area of soil without competition from nearby plants. So double your normal space intervals uh, or a little bit more uh, to have success. <laughs> 
And so um, a couple of other notes on that really quickly is um, you can direct sow. Um, I did a lot of direct sowing, all of my uh, melons, my, my cucumbers, my, car uh, my squashes, my melons, uh, my carrots were all direct sown. Bush beans were direct sown. It is a generally good idea to, um, where practical, again, bigger seeded crops, to soak those, to initiate the germination process. Obviously, you're not going to do that with carrots. It's not practical with those tiny seeds. But pre-soaking your bean seeds or pre-soaking your squash and melon seeds will enable them to swell up with moisture without depleting the available moisture that's, uh, that's there in the, uh, in the soil. You're going to want to mud in your crops. So this means you're going to be prepping your planting hole. You're going to want to water the planting hole. And then you're going to want to do your planting. This is what, whether you're direct sowing or whether you're, uh, you're transplanting. After you've done your transplant in or your planting in, you're going to want to water the planting area again. And then take your hands and spread them out and push down. Not, we're not trying to create a heavily compacted area, but you're trying to compress these uh, soil layers, soil vessels. Um, to trap that moisture in so it's not evaporating out quickly, but also to create the channels that the, the moisture will keep wicking in from the surroundings. So you've got to do this kind of mud in, press in to help seal those, those layers so that the moisture is still available. It's very valuable to mulch immediately after planting. Using a compost mulch is fine. It is critical that you take the time to, uh, to weed very, very thoroughly. Uh, now, one of the things you'll notice is that that problem really goes away as the summer progresses. It, it's a pretty typical uh, keeping on top of the weeds in May and June, just like the rest of the garden. But without irrigation, as we get to the late June and early July, you notice a substantial decrease in the, in the surrounding weed germination rates. Uh, and in the dry garden, you're getting almost nothing new coming up. And in the irrigated garden, you're still fighting it all the time. During those early stages of weed suppression, it's fine to pull weeds, but take the time to actually cultivate. So you'll have the planting area you prepped, again, maybe double the dimension you normally would for planting a plant. Um, so you might be looking at areas 15 or 16 inches across prepped. You don't want to be cultivating in there because you don't want to be disturbing that soil area. It's okay to hand weed anything that's coming up in there, but don't do a hoe cultivation in there. Outside of that area, uh, even if you don't have a ton of weeds in that immediate area right around the plants, Take the time to scuff up some of those surface native soils with your, with your hoe or cultivator, and then rake some of that crumb soil back up over the planting area. Thin, you don't want to create uh, excessive depth, um, and avoid bruising or damaging the stems of the plants planted there in the middle. But doing some of that crumb, uh, crumb layering over your organic mulch will actually help trap even more moisture in and reduce some of the, uh, the moisture demand. So some pictures of proper plant spacings here. Um, so if you look on the dry garden on the left, so this I'm literally standing in one spot and shooting to the left is the dry garden and shooting to the right is the irrigated garden. You see it's about a third, two thirds. And you look at the irrigated garden, it's the typical lush Northwest garden with, with big robust plants growing everywhere and hardly walking space between, barely enough room for the crops to mature. And this is again, uh, this is an early summer picture, it's about July. Um, so as these crops continue to grow and mature, they're gonna get occupy all that space. There's literally no space to walk in, in my irrigated garden in the, in, the, in the height of summer. The dry garden on, on, on the contrast is, very widely spaced. So there is a lot of soil that's not being cultivated. And you can see the, la the little last little bits of weeds coming up from the, from the, from the cultivation, as I said, uh, early mid-July here. Um, so crops are developing along nicely, but they're widely spaced out. That's, that's really an appropriate spacing uh, for, the, for, the, for the dry garden. Um, so we talked about the timing. Make sure you're, 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 you're timing those to uh, get your timing planning. If you're starting your own starts, you need to be really careful to 
to uh, time them appropriately. You know, uh, tomatoes take six to eight weeks, peppers 10 to 12 weeks before they're ready to transplant. Um, melons and squashes take about five weeks. You don't want to have plants ready before you can put them out. It's gonna stress them. You also don't want to be, be able to work the soil and get started and have plants that are not ready to transplant out. Um, so starting your own is definitely doable, but you have to kind of think it through very carefully. You have less cushion than you do in the rest of the garden. Um, many starts are readily available at your local garden centers too, if you would like to buy them when you're ready, that gives you an option as well. But nothing wrong with starting your own, just time it carefully, read up on it, make sure you understand what the cycle is of, uh, of seed to transplant. When you're direct sowing, we talk about pre-soaking the seeds to jumpstart germination, that's definitely well, and um, mudding in. Um, and we've got to get that moisture in there early. So we do one, that whole garden you were looking at, the dry garden, was one physical watering with watering cans at planting. And then I gave them no irrigation for the rest of the summer. Um, some other tips, fertilize thoroughly at planting time. It's a good idea to get a nice organic um, fertilizer source, or organic granular source or a manure source, thoroughly worked in at the planting time. You can still supplementally feed, we often do. I did uh, a supplemental feeding like I usually do for the vegetable garden uh, early July, usually about the time my, my May fertilizers are beginning to kind of run out of steam. The results were, the pickup was slower with that summer fertilizer application, probably because of the drier soil really reducing the soil microbiology. Uh, your organic fertilizers are dependent upon your soil microbiology to break them down into forms that plants can use. And that doesn't happen well when there's a low microbial population. That can occur when your soils are super dry. Mulching at planting is critical, crumb soil raking in. It is perfectly fine and okay to use fabric mulches. Um, if, if you will see a couple more pictures, I think if you look or if we went back a little bit, um, my tomatoes and peppers have um, black, black um, weed barrier fabric mulches. That's effective mulches for moisture conservation and weed suppression. Um, so that's certainly an option for your crops as well as actual compost mulches. But do that, cul that cultivation and crumb soil cover over, it does make a significant difference in their moisture tolerance. Weed suppression is essential in the early part of the season. It does go away, but you, you, they're less tolerant of competition in this dry garden, so you really have to be on your weeding game. So some takeaways from this. Um, first takeaway is, you don't have to be all dry garden or all irrigated garden. You can do different areas differently. You can do like I did and split up uh, the sections. Um, so you don't, you don't have to dedicate, even if you're not doing exclusively purely dry gardening, I want you to take away from this little, little, uh, little class. Vegetables often need much less water than we give them, even in an irrigated garden. So consider your watering practices in light of this as well. Feel free to, uh, to explore uh, and, and, and experiment with this. Um, so for me, the experiments in the dry garden, really, I, I knew the tomatoes and squashes were gonna be a great success. They always are. Melons, I've heard so many good things about them. The more borderline crops, the bush beans and the kale were total experimentation, just to see how that would work out and then, you gotta play a little bit. I, I tried some culinary herbs in the dry garden as well. I do a fair amount of them mixed into the vegetables in the, in the irrigated garden. Um, and you can see that in the right hand picture, uh, kind of the right side by side and kind of the, the two extremes of the success. The cilantro plant gave me one quick harvest of cilantro and then flowered out, which was fine because I, I let them seed out. I harvest them as, as, as coriander seed. And so they did a, a, a light cilantro harvest and an excellent yield of, of coriander seed. I got one small handful of leaves off of that poor basil plant. They definitely needed more moisture, even in our humid Pacific Northwest, uh, than they were getting in the dry garden. And that was, a, that was kind of the failure. So play around with this. Um, pictures on both these pictures, by the way, is, is 1st of August last year. And you can see the, the, the typical results. And as we hit the end of the season, uh, or the beginning of the real harvest season in a lot of these crops, um, late August, August 20th, 2020, looking out over the dry garden. You notice the, uh, the bush beans are showing a little bit of, uh, of burn, but they did flush back, reflowered and reharvested. The melons are really starting to come on and set some fruit. Uh, fruit's really beginning to get close to maturation by the end of August. 
tomatoes and peppers are in production. Kale is being harvested. Um, just, just an overall a, a fun little experiment and, uh, and well worth repeating. And I will be doing more again this next year. So that's what I, uh, I had for you for, for, uh, for talking points and lecture. I would entertain any questions you guys have on this, either in chat or if you want to unmute and ask them verbally. I, I was wondering, um, I, I'm a little concerned about the, the soil, those microorganisms and such um, drying out. And it, uh, I'm so used to mulching, maybe too much, and, and just you know having a lot of organic matter in my soil that I wonder if it'd be used up for the second year or whatever, or, or I mean, it'd be much That's less. Excellent point, Marilyn. And, and one of the key things, um, if you read the literature on, on dry gardening, is after a year in dry garden, you should switch out to irrigated or fallow for one to two years. Um, you shouldn't dry garden the same patch year over year because you are depleting soil nutrition, soil microorganisms. Uh, so definitely a valuable point. Um, do take those interim periods, whether it's an actual fallow period or if you're, if you're not doing any irrigated gardening or swapping that section out to irrigation for, uh, for a season or two before going back to a dry garden in that situation. Because you can damage your, your, soil, your soil microorganisms. Mulching is incredibly valuable. Um, and I say the pictures don't show all the mulching we did because they're covered over with crumb soil. A lot of dry gardening is using the inherent native soil as a mulch in addition to your, to your compost. Obviously that's gonna depend a bit on your soil, uh, your soil texture and, and availability. Um, it's worth noting, I'm on, let's say wetland clay. I have been physically gardening this particular patch uh, for 20, 24, 25 years now. So it's a well-established vegetable garden that gets cover cropped and thoroughly amended every year. Um, so there's a, despite the clay content, there's a pretty good humus content in that soil as well. Uh, questions in the chat. Do I find there are less pests in the dry garden? Uh, I did not notice any decrease in most pests in the dry garden. Uh, it was a definite decrease in slugs in the dry garden, which is a, a, a definitely a value and benefit right there. Um, there was perhaps some, there was no, some noticeable decrease in mildew and leaf spot disease organisms in the dry garden, but it wasn't massive, but it was noticeable. Uh, beetles were comparable, aphids were comparable across the garden. Of course, it is the dry and irrigated garden are side by side, so they're entirely possible there's some bleed over. One of the things that is, um, when we talk about pest control, and if you go through a lot of the, the various literature that's on the topic, um, there are, um, with, with plants that are widely spaced, islands of green in a contrasting color, like a soil color or, a, or, a, or an off color mulch color uh, all around them. Pests tend to find those crops more readily they do, than they do plants that are where you have different types of plants kind of running together, um, where there's less differentiation visually. It's certainly not an absolute. So uh, there is some concern that having wide, these big islands of green with these wide spaces in between it might actually increase certain visual or visually oriented pests. In addition, dry gardening is inherently somewhat stressful to the plants. Stress plants are less able to fight off insect pests. I had no increase in insect pests at all in the garden. I had minor decrease in mollusks and, and, and diseases. Um, so no major issues, but I would not count on it being a, a, a solution to uh, insect pests. Good literature for learning about plants and maturation cycles for using seeds. Um, so um, in our immediate marketplace, Territorial Seed Company, which is a local Oregon seed company, um, mail order, their catalog is, is an inherently excellent reference on vegetable gardening generically. Um, they have a wide variety of, uh, of resources there on various types of crops, you know, what, how, what you're expecting for germinations, uh, germination success rate, time to germination, that kind of thing. Um, we also um, have some handouts we use here at the nursery that are that give some estimations on time from transplant from seed to transplant, um, and you guys can look those up on our website. I know they're on the website, or if you if you're having trouble chasing them down, if you want to shoot me an email, Darren at Shenards.com. 
Uh, I'm perfectly happy to respond to your emails and, and forward you any of that kind of information you need. Other good literature about dry gardening, of course, Oregon State University, the Extension Service, um, OSU has, uh, has some articles and handouts on there uh, available online about dry farming and dry gardening. That's very, worth, very worthwhile pursuing. Okay, so does it matter if the soil is dry due to lack of rain or because of large trees nearby? It definitely matters. Um, you know, dry, dry, dry growing season climates are one thing. Um, there are limits of plants we can grow, but there are ways to make that work. When you have large trees nearby stealing all the available moisture, that is a whole nother issue uh, because they're taking all of the moisture out of the surrounding soil uh, and they're not sharing. So that's definitely a relevant concern. Competition is is a consideration. You need to have the space without too much in the way of tree roots. Um, you notice how what my garden space is laid out like in these pictures. Um, now I've got a few fruit trees on the uh, on the uh, west and northwest ends of this, um, and I have a big. Um, well, we lost our big biggest tree, but I've got a couple of trees well away on the east side, but they're 20 to 30 feet away from the vegetable garden. So. No, no real overlap of roots, a few small roots working into the edge of the garden, but it's not too bad. Um, when I had a bigger tree on the west side of this garden, which we uh, eventually lost to a heart rot problem, um, that was more of an issue in the garden as a whole. There was a lot of tree roots into that competing for space and, and moisture content. All right, so I'm caught up with the chat. Anybody else have any questions in? I'd be happy to take. What would you like to try that you haven't yet? Yeah, good question. What would I like to try that I haven't tried yet? Sweet potatoes. I I think I think I can get away with that. Um, I am probably going to try that because I'm going to expand the amount of dry garden a little bit this year, but I'm not going to bet my whole sweet potato crop on it. Um, but theoretically, they should work. Uh, that'll be my next, I think, big experiment. Some things I know don't work well, I've tried marginally, I even, even just running them towards the edges of true dry. Cucumbers don't do well in really dry climates, you can, in dry, dry gardening. You might get a small crop off of quick turn cukes, but don't count on it, you don't have that sustained harvest. They do really decline rapidly in an unirrigated. Um, most leaf crops, kale was kind of the, the, the welcome, uh, welcome discovery of an addition because most leaf crops just take a lot more moisture shallow rooted. Theoretically, you would think onions and, and garlic would be ideal. Garlic can be done because it's overwintered and you're harvesting out as we're getting into the dry cycle. Onions could be the same, but onions have such small root systems that really drying out can, can really damage their quality. So I haven't been brave enough to try that one yet. I might in the future. Uh, it concerns me a bit just knowing enough about growing them that I'm concerned that without regular irrigation during their, their final uh, expansion stages that I'm not gonna get much bulb. Question in the chat, do eggshells add calcium to the soil? Eggshells absolutely add calcium to the soil. Um, eggshell calcium is relatively slow in availability. So you're eggshelling your, your garden, not necessarily at planting, but even the year ahead for, for good calcium availability. Um, I use uh, uh, lime, limestone. Um, be aware that lime comes in a couple of flavors. Um, dolomitic lime doesn't have that much calcium. It's a great pH adjuster, but it's got a lot of magnesium. Um, so calcium lime for a calcium source is a reliable, steady source. If you ever were to get in a pinch, because I, I hate to encourage people to try new things in the garden and they have a really, really abysmal failure. If you're having trouble with calcium availability in your dry garden, um, you can spray liquid calcium. There are liquid calcium sources that are foliar sprays. You start escaping the, the actual truly dry garden when you start applying anything with liquid on the leaves, but um, I don't think there's enough liquid in that to matter personally, and that would get you by a season uh, as you learn. Um, so Seed Company, Territorial Seed Company um, is an excellent resource for growing in the Pacific Northwest. Um, a lot of their information is relevant for other climates, but they really are focused on, uh, they're, they're here in Western Oregon, they're really fo focused on growing in our climate, uh, but there's a great deal of information out there um, and well worth reading. I say, I, I mean, I do this professionally, plus gardening at home. I still pick up a new catalog of theirs at least every couple of years just to review and get new varieties and, and any new information they've included in. So it's a really, really solid reference there. All right, 
I want to thank you all for attending on, on an Easter Sunday and in the peak of the, of the season. Okay, would a system of swales be beneficial in our climate? Um, theoretically, yes, creating a water reservoir in a swale that the plants planted around the swale can access um, could definitely be beneficial to your swale will hold water longer than the surrounding soils. Really not an issue on my wetland soil because it's kind of like that anyway. Um, but that if you have the space and the time and energy to incorporate into that concept, um, that might be an excellent way to expand your ability to dry garden. All right, thank you all very much. I appreciate it. And they're gonna send me back to uh, working here at the nursery now. So uh, enjoy, okay. Oh, I'm gonna cut, I'll catch the rest of these chats here real quick anyway. Um, Los Angeles Basin, it's a real desert, and we have already had our last rain and the continuing severe drought in Southern Cal. Compare uh, my summer dry gardening to your winter garden. That seems fair. I think you're probably right, not having a lot of experience in the desert Southwest, but that does seem to be the case. Um, you can grow a lot of crops over the winter that we can't because we freeze. Um, so a lot of these summer crops that we can't handle uh, until May or June because our last frost date is May 18th for Western Oregon. Um, very relevant to, to what you might be doing there. And uh, you're, you're not that wet even in, in, the, in the winter, as I understand. So it seems very comparable set of information. Uh, I know there are some resources for, for dryland gardening in California. I would contact any of your uh, extension universities and see what, what info they have for you because it's out there. People are doing it down there as well. All right, well, thank you all so much and I'll sign off now. Uh, have, a, have a good Easter.